My name is Tony Lovkovich. I'm a professor of geography at the University of Ottawa, and uh, my field is permafrost science. So I'm trained as a geographer, but uh, I, uh, and I started out working more in the area of hydrology and geomorphology, but in the, in the Arctic, and then moved more into studying permafrost as an object of study. So when you're working on hydrology and geomorphology, those are really influenced by the presence of permafrost. But now I'm at the point where I'm studying the permafrost, and particularly permafrost distribution and changes uh, in, through time. Uh, and so I, I guess that's where my, my, uh, my research relates to climate change, as almost anybody who works in the polar regions now says their work relates to climate change one way or another. But climate change is impacting the permafrost in multiple ways. Um, the challenge is that it's not, it's not that simple. It's easier to see relationships between climate change and some of the other elements of the cryosphere, like sea ice or land ice or snow, than it is to see the relationship between climate change and permafrost, because permafrost is hidden. It's under the ground. Permafrost is really crucial because it's the only element of the cryosphere that people live on year-round. People travel on the sea ice, but they don't live on it. They don't live on glaciers, but they do live on permafrost. And so as permafrost changes takes pl take place, then the climate change, the long-term climate change, is going to have major impacts on northern populations. I like to describe permafrost as being like defrosting a turkey. If you take a turkey out or a chicken out of your freezer, it's going to be at minus 20 or so, depending on how you, you can keep your freezer. If you put it on the countertop and you stick a thermistor into it, and I've done this, then what happens is the temperature warms up quite, quite quickly to very close to zero and then it sits just below zero for a very long time. And the reason it does so is because the heat you need to change the ice within the, the chicken's uh, uh, tissues into water is a lot of heat. It's the latent heat of fusion. Whereas when you're warming it up, you add much less heat for every degree change. It's, uh, it's the specific heat of, of the material, in this case, a, a frozen turkey or a frozen chicken. So it sits and sits and sits, and then once it goes through zero, then it warms up again quite quickly. And that's the point where you definitely don't want to eat it, because it'll have all sorts of bad things in it. So in terms of what's happening to permafrost, if the permafrost is sitting at minus 15, it will, it's quite easy to warm it to minus 14. But if it's sitting at minus a half a degree, it's very hard to warm it to plus a half a degree. And so, curiously enough, when we look at changes to permafrost, we see that the cold permafrost is changing faster in terms of temperature than the warm permafrost, because it's just hanging on, waiting to try and thaw. And it takes a lot of new energy getting into the ground, a lot of surplus energy getting into the ground to, to create that thaw. So we see that in the high Arctic of Canada, the, and elsewhere in the high Arctic, in Russia and, uh, and uh, Alaska, the colder the permafrost is, the more it's reacting as a thermometer. It's a good thermometer. When it reaches very close to zero, it's not a very good thermometer anymore. But of course, that's the part that we really care about, because that's where we'll see changes happening to infrastructure or changes happening to hydrology as we, uh, as we lose permafrost. And uh, so a lot of my work, where we're working actually at the real southern fringe of permafrost, uh, in uh, right where it almost doesn't exist anymore. And at that point, it's not everywhere through the landscape. It's just in little p patches. And one of our questions is, how big are those patches? How are they changing through time? What are th what's the temperature of those patches? And what's their thickness? And so we're doing work along the Alaska Highway and the Yukon on that. And I've also worked in the high Arctic. And I'm working with uh, somebody from the Geological Survey of Canada, uh, Sharon Smith, where we have a lot of boreholes in common where we're looking at temperature changes. We're looking at spatial changes, temperature changes, and how those will impact uh, through time, as I said, ultimately the people that live there. Mm. Remember that turkey? It takes a long time to thaw. So what's happening is taking a long time. It's not disappearing overnight. It's not going to disappear overnight. And when we, some of the things that bugs are, bug us as, as permafrost scientists is when we, we read, oh, the permafrost area is going to diminish by this huge amount in the next couple of decades. It won't. It's going to be there for hundreds of years. We are seeing changes, but the changes happen slowly because you need all that additional heat to get into the ground to, to make things happen. What we don't know, what, what, what is hard to predict, is when those changes may accelerate. So at this point, they're happening relatively slowly. We did a study along the Alaska Highway in that very fringe zone, so where the permafrost is quite marginal. There was a survey done in 1964 that we repeated in 2008. And 
Uh, the person who did the survey in 1964, who was a, a, a researcher from Canada, from uh, the National Research Council here, whose name was Roger Brown, and he went out looking for permafrost. And so we can assume that the sites he checked were ones that were most prone to have permafrost at that time, and he found a whole bunch of sites. So we went back and tried to find the same sites using a series of archival data to try and position ourselves and find the correct place. We can't be sure, but, but you know, we're pretty sure that, that we were in the same places. And of his sites, half of those have lost permafrost since 1964. So over almost 50 years, a little less than 50 years, there was significant change in that marginal zone and the, the, the southern fringe of permafrost, because we saw that along the highway, which runs basically southeast and northwest, Along the highway, the biggest change was in the southern part and less change as we went towards the north, which is exactly what we'd expect if this was climatically induced. And uh, so we can see that the southern fringe there has probably moved northwards by 50, 75, 80 kilometers. So there's a boundary. We say this is the boundary of permafrost. Of course, it's a boundary in a landscape. There's very few patches that are actually there. And south of that now, the patches that did exist have gone. So we see changes there in terms of actual distribution. There are almost certainly other changes taking place, even in the places where there is still permafrost, the ones that he found that still have permafrost, because not, not every, it didn't disappear everywhere. But we don't know what they are. We, we are now making measurements of those sites, and we might say there's 10 meters of permafrost there now. Well, maybe there were 20 meters of permafrost when he did that survey, but we have no way of telling. And as we go further north then, Instead of looking at changes to the distribution of permafrost so much, what we're looking at is changes of temperature. And there, as I said, permafrost is a very good, you know, it's a very reliable way of measuring the long-term impacts of climate because most of our sites where we're measuring ground temperatures are away from cities. So the, one of the skept skeptical comments that gets put out is, ah, oh, no, it's all just urban heat island. No, no, these are in the middle of nowhere. So it, 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 it's not heat island effects. And the second thing that happens with permafrost is it, it, it smooths out all the inter-year variability and uh, all the intra-year variability and much of the inter-year variability as we go down further into the ground. So it's a pretty good long-term thermometer. And there we can see that in the time we've been making measurements, say the last, uh, particularly in Canada in the last 30 to 40 years, we have some pretty good long-term records from the Mackenzie Valley and from a few other sites that the permafrost is warm by a degree or a degree and a half quite often uh, over that time period. So get rid of all the external pro uh, potential problems. What you've got is a good, reliable, long-term thermometer, and it's showing that the, the north is warming. The answer is yes and no in terms of slowdown, because it depends where you are. Canada is a big country. We have a lot of time zones. <laughs> and um, in fact, what we're seeing is that in some areas, the warming has continued or even got faster. And in other areas, yes, there's been a slowdown. And again, that's a typical thing that's predicted by climate models, but everybody tends to forget it. So when we integrate everything globally, we can see that things are getting warmer. But locally, they, they, they're not necessarily getting warmer. So in fact, some of the areas I work in in the Yukon have been fairly flat. But uh, at the same time, in the eastern Arctic, uh, in Labrador and going up the east coast up towards Ellesmere Island, things have taken off in terms, of, in terms of heating up. The Arctic islands in particular really seem to have warmed up, particularly in summer. And I just saw some, uh, some photographs that were taken of an area I've worked in on Ellesmere Island, and these were taken by somebody who was there two years ago. And it's just astonishing the number of um, thaw slumps that have been created there, which is where permafrost gets exposed and the ice inside the permafrost melts. And you get major uh, reactions in, the, in landslides, really. That would be probably the best way to describe them. There's, a, there's a, a lot of them at some sites where I had been working at since 1985 and had never seen anything like that. And now there's significant parts of the landscape that's being affected by, by thawing, uh, thawing permafrost and melting ground ice. I didn't do the survey in 64, so I, I haven't actually personally seen that. And people often ask me, oh, you must have seen many changes. And I've been working in the Arctic since 1976. Uh, so I, that's a pretty long time. And honestly, it's not that easy to see them. I think you need to go to particular ecological boundaries to see change. Uh, if you go, you know, if you go to somewhere that's very cold, like Ellesmere is, is minus 14 or minus 15 as a mean annual air temperature, 
if it goes up by a degree and a half, you know, there may or may not be a reaction in the landscape to that kind of a change. Um, or if you go to a place where it's bedrock, uh, well, bedrock is, you know, it's quite happy to be minus 14 or minus 15, doesn't care. If you go to the right places, like places where there's a lot of ice uh, in the ground, and you go to the right zone, which is moving from being a permafrost landscape to being a non-permafrost landscape, that's how you're going to see those changes. So they are, even today, those changes are happening locally, uh, rather than, let's say, across the whole Arctic. We see advances of shrub cover into the tundra, which is going to affect snow distribution, which in turn affects permafrost. Um, or we see uh, uh, thawing of peat plateau, which have permafrost in, and uh, the marshes uh, adjacent to them are helping add heat into, the, into the, those, those peat islands. And, and one of the questions where, uh, where, the, where the jury is still out is whether the thawing of permafrost and the potential um, uh, decomposition of the carbon in the permafrost will have a further uh, important impact on global climate. And I, I've just been at a conference, so I, ca I can say that honestly the jury's still out. We're seeing different things coming in from different studies as to whether uh, you change a peat plateau into a bog. Well, it turns out the plants grow quite well in the bog, and that may actually be a carbon sink. On the other hand, uh, if you uh, if you change the peat plateau into something else, it could be you'll get aerobic breakdown and carbon dioxide release. So the carbon dioxide methane partitioning and the, the question of exactly what pathways will be followed as permafrost thaws is still, still an open question. But there's a significant risk there because there's so much carbon stored in permafrost. The publication on how much carbon was stored in permafrost only came out in 2009. So it's five years ago that we began to realize that there was you know, twice as much as there is in the atmosphere. And, um, and then we went, whoa, you know, it was, it was a surprise and it shows how we're still capable of being surprised about the North and about the importance of, of the various components. Um, and that came out from people that worked on soils. So soils, if I may put it this way, is not the most sexy subject, at least it's not to me. Of course, if you're a pedologist, you might feel different. And yet the result of basic, basic research that was being done was finally put together through international collaboration into, a, into a, a sum total, and then the answer came back, this is a very serious question. And I think that there are always going to be surprises like that in, in the North, but probably in science, global science in general, where we suddenly discover something that we've more or less ignoring and very few people have been working on is actually really, really very important. I don't think we know uh, what percentage risk there is, um, but um, the, the worry is that the answer could be serious. That, uh, and so that, that's why I think we have to continue working on that question, because we, we just don't have the answers right now. And I, I can perhaps just explain, I sort of talked a little earlier about it, but if we uh, have carbon in permafrost and that permafrost degrades in a wet way, so we end up with marshes or bogs or fens, then we are likely to release methane. Of course, if it decays in a dry way, we're likely to release carbon dioxide. And the methane is a much more uh, important greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So the exact, you can decay the same amount of permafrost with the same amount of organic carbon in it, and one will have a much greater impact than the other. And so we need to understand better if we degrade permafrost or as we degrade permafrost, which pathway is more likely to be followed. And, and we don't have that answer right now. The Alaska Highway, which I've referred to a couple of times, so it runs from northern British Columbia up to the border with Alaska through the, through the, through the Yukon. The last 100 kilometers is a mess. All the rest of it is not too bad. There may be permafrost in the terrain adjacent to it, but there's no permafrost beneath the highway because of all the disturbance associated with the highway It's uh, over the last, uh, since it was built in the, sec in the middle of the Second World War. But the last 100 kilometers, there's permafrost beneath the highway. And the problem is it's got lots of ice in it and uh, it's thawing. So the impact of the highway being there, the throwing off of snow that takes place on either side, which acts as an insulator in the, in the wintertime, building up of snow banks, uh, all add uh, extra heat into the ground. And uh, a few years ago, it was paved. Before that, it was a gravel road. And we wanted an all-weather highway, so we paved it. And uh, the problem is that asphalt doesn't do well if you start lowering the ground 
but not lowering it uniformly, lowering it differentially. So this part goes down by a meter and that part goes down by only 50 centimeters. And guess what? The asphalt cracks in between and then you drive a truck over it and it all breaks apart. So it's extraordinarily expensive for the Yukon Highways Department to maintain that last 100 kilometers of highway as it gets towards the, the border. The reason is it's simply colder there, so the permafrost has been preserved despite the highway being on it, but the presence of the highway is causing progressive thaw. Well, that's one example in terms of infrastructure. Another one that is, uh, that is now, uh, that we know about, that is the most common example, is simply everything costs a lot more because of permafrost. So when we build a building on permafrost, we may have to uh, construct it in a way that will stop the permafrost from thawing. Great. Uh, so we put down piles, or we put them on a gravel pad, and all sorts of different techniques have been used. So we can cope with permafrost, and of course, non-permafrost is the way everybody builds in the rest of the world, so we know how to cope with that. But you know, there are no real techniques to cope with permafrost that will thaw. So we put a building on piles, and if climate warming then causes that permafrost to thaw, the piles lose their strength. They, even before the, the ground completely thaws, and I'll go back to my chicken and turkey analogy at the beginning and say, if you've ever tried thawing a turkey on your, or a chicken on your, on, your, uh, on your countertop, before it's completely thawed, it kind of goes to this semi-resistant state where you can still feel there may be ice crystals inside. The soil does the same thing as it's thawing. So it loses strength even while some part of the water inside is, is still in ice form. Other parts of the water inside have now become liquid form. And so, of course, it isn't as strong as it was when it was minus 5. It's now you know, minus a half a degree or minus 0.2 of a degree. So we know that, uh, that buildings in, in that condition will start to have problems of, uh, of their structure even before the permafrost thaws at a given site. So we can cope with permafrost and we can cope with non-permafrost, but that transition from permafrost to non-permafrost is really problematic. We honestly don't have good engineering solutions for that. Well, there would be other impacts on, on uh, the rest of the environment. Um, as an example, when we have permafrost present, then water flow is confined to the near surface generally. So you get a rainstorm, the water penetrates into the ground, and it'll go to perhaps a meter depth until it reaches the frost table, or the, what we call the permafrost table, if it's the deepest uh, point that's uh, thawed during the summertime. So in a permafrost area, the water tends to be relatively shallow in its, in its pathways. It infiltrates and then it goes sideways down to the, the local river eventually. But if you have permafrost thawing, then you will start to have the possibility for that water to get deeper into the groundwater system, perhaps depths to tens of meters. So there will be a change in the way the rivers behave in an area where permafrost exists and where it begins to thaw um, simply because the pathways for that water will change. And there have been some studies that suggest that you can pick that up even in big rivers. So it, it may not even be a bad thing. Uh, ironically, it may allow rivers to flow more during the winter time and somewhat be less flashy, less uh, prone to flooding in the summertime because water penetrates more deeply. But the, the flow in the winter, if it happens when there's ice, when, it, when it's cold, you can get icings forming, so which are, are known uh, in, in the Yukon and Northwest Territories, where you get huge expanses in river valleys of ice layer, building up one layer on top of the other on top of the other until it's meters thick. So again, maybe in a river valley, that's not so bad, but if, it, if you've got a small stream that's meant to go through a culvert underneath the road, and that stream keeps flowing now, and therefore it spreads ice out. Believe me, if you've ever tried walking on one of these things, you can't. It, they're just completely slippery, and so then it becomes a problem for transportation again. So that's one other example of how permafrost can imp or changes in permafrost can impact uh, the rest of the the rest of the, bi the biosphere, geosphere, atmosphere. Um, another example would be that we expect uh, greater landsliding. So we, um, there are uh, different kinds of landslides that are unique to permafrost regions, one of which is called an active layer detachment. And this is where the surface of the ground, to a depth of perhaps uh, a meter, just basically slips off and goes downslope. And normally you can't do that unless you uh, turn the ground to, to mud to a very liquid mud. So we get mud flows in, in areas where you get heavy rainstorms. But 
Active layer detachments can happen where the, where the active layer, the layer that thaws in the summertime, moves almost like a block. And to do that, you have to have virtually zero friction at the bottom of the active layer. And that happens when you thaw the ground rapidly. So if you put a lot of heat into the ground in summer, at the time when the, the layer at the bottom of the active layer is slowly thawing, You'll thaw it faster, you generate water, and that creates an almost frictionless surface, and so we see these active layer detachments move down slope. Similar to um, like the Greenland ice sheet, where the water is lubricating the base of the glacier. Yeah, that's, that's a very good analogy, absolutely. And um, we've, uh, I've done some studies of those on, on Ellesmere, and one year we were lucky enough to be there when they happened. Uh, and so, you know, I woke up one morning and looked up slow and went, that wasn't there yesterday. Uh, and uh, the, it, I'd been studying for about 20 years at that point, but had never seen them happen. Yeah. Nobody had ever seen them happen. So, so well, the ground detached. The, uh, the surface began to slide down slope. Our tents were down below. We weren't in any danger. Uh, this is happening quite slowly. Uh, but uh, the, this small failure uh, began with probably a slide of about five to ten meters long and maybe three or four meters hard, wide and over the next four days it progressed to be something close to 300 meters long and about 50 meters wide and so the material slides down slope slowly and piles up as a big mass at the bottom and there have been a number of studies since then not done by me but by other people of failures the same kind of failures but looking at really what it what they do to the um, the sediment balance in drainage basins to see what their impact is and they are almost certainly going to become more common as, as the, the, the summer temperatures in particular warm in the high arctic. Uh, so we're, we're likely going to see more we, we, and it's the other studies done by uh, at Queen's University showed that at least for a few years there's a serious amount of, of extra material that goes into streams which obviously can then have knock-on effects on the aquatic environment and on fish, uh, fish uh, productivity and invertebrates and everything else that's happening in streams. So, you know, these are so many of these things are kind of domino effects where that was produced by a particularly warm period with a lot of sunshine that triggered a very small failure that then grew through the processes that are inherent to the permafrost being present and that then has the potential, because there's a lot of them happening, it wasn't just one, we, we happened to be camped down slope of one, but they were happening all around us, um, can then put extra sediment in the streams, which has its own impact further down the line. And I think that, again, our ability to, to get all the global, all the impacts and really understand all of them is still quite limited. We, we, need, we need further uh, further studies to really understand all of those things. I think the most interesting question in the field at the moment is the one about carbon. Uh, because it is imponderable, but it's a real potential, or we don't have the answer to it, but it's a, a significant risk. And uh, it could be that in 10 years' time we'll say, no problem. Or it could be we'll say, wow, we've got a serious issue here. And, and I, I can't tell you, I don't think anybody can tell you right now which, which is the correct answer, because we're seeing different results from different individual field studies, and our ability to to upscale from individual field studies is not yet good enough uh, for us to understand why some of them are showing sinks and some of them are showing sources. N not that we know of, I, I would have to say not that we know of. And there's some evidence, um, uh, some studies that say permafrost has endured for a very long time, even in areas which are not that cold. So in the Dawson area in the central Yukon, uh, there's been work that says uh, we have ice wedges, which are bodies of ice in the permafrost. And above an ice wedge, uh, there's a tephra layer, so from volcanic eruptions, and the tephra can be dated. And there's a study been done by Dwayne Froze from the University of Alberta that says, above an ice wedge, there's a tephra layer that's 600,000 years old. So that should mean that the ice wedge had to have existed six, more than 600,000 years ago and made it through all the interglacials. So in other words, the permafrost had to have existed consistently because there's no way to reform an ice wedge beneath uh, a, an intact tephra layer. Uh, that really surprises me because the area is not that cold. You know, the, the ground there is maybe minus one, maybe minus, minus two, something like that. So I, I would have thought it would have disappeared in the interglacials, but apparently not. So that suggests that, and you know, coming back to the, the comment about you know, the stuff that uh, 
Yes, we've seen change in the real southern fringe in the last 50 years, but we've also seen persistence in the same area where some sites still have permafrost. So it's not that easy to get rid of, luckily for us, perhaps. Well, you might be able to tell from my accent that originally I was in England. Uh, so I did my undergraduate degree in England and then uh, the, my supervisor for graduate work, who was already at the University of Ottawa, had done his uh, PhD at the University of Southampton in England where I did my undergraduate. And we made contact through his old links. And then I had the choice of either staying in England and doing a PhD on glaciers in Switzerland, joining the civil service, or coming to Canada to work on a master's in the, in the Arctic. And I said, you know, I think of those three, A, the Arctic sounds more interesting, and B, it sounds more like I'll have a job at the end. So that's how I ended up working on uh, in, the, in the Arctic. Do you do much um, communication of your science uh, to the general public? Whenever I get the opportunity, I'm, I'm really happy to do it. Yeah, I've given public lectures and uh, if the, if the press asks me for interviews, I'm, I, I think that's part of every scientist's uh, role nowadays. We have to do our best to try and um, make sometimes quite complex things understandable. Mm. And uh, one, of my, one of my colleagues once said to me, and he went on to do something important with one of the granting councils in, in, in Canada, he said, it's very important to have what analogies you choose. So I use the frozen turkey analogy because many people at least have some experience of that. It's not the best, but it, it's not bad. In Canada, the best analogy to use is a hockey analogy, but I can never think of anything to do with hockey and permafrost. <laughs> Try it out on your mother. <laughs> if your mother understands it, then everybody else will too, <laughs> in the sense that she probably is gonna go, as my mother did, well, it's very interesting, dear, but I don't quite understand it all. And so then it's your role to try, try and make it understandable. My own feeling is that it seems to be more common among those who are geologists than those who are geographers, and I'm trained as a geographer, and I think that's something to do with timescales. Um, and I've had, certainly had students who've come up to me after taking a first year class from me where I've talked about climate change, where one third of the class is all about how the radiation balance works and then uh, eventually we come through to what the IPCC is saying and why we would expect climate change and what the IPCC reports. And uh, well, a student came up to me and said, but I'm taking a class from this other professor and he says it's all wrong. And now what am I to think? And, and, and I, my answer has been, I have a lot of respect for that individual. What he does in many parts of his science is very good. Uh, it's not just he's a, he's a climate change skeptic, but he does lots of other things too. And um, you'll just have to make your own judgment as to which one you think is true. But uh, obviously I, I then say but the, the percentage weight of those who believe in climate change uh, hugely outweighs the number of those who don't. And uh, I use the own, my own experience to say, as I, as I said earlier, permafrost doesn't lie. You know, it's one of the best ways I think we have of demonstrating climate change, simply because it eliminates many of the negative, many of the skeptical comments that are made about the long-term records that we have from you know places like London or any urban areas. And indeed, when you go to southern Canada. You know, the climate record may be being influenced by urbanization or by change to agriculture and so on, but it's very difficult to make that argument if you've got a site somewhere in northern Canada where the, the change is negligible. Uh, there's something else that probably influences people, I think, as they think about climate change, and I believe it's actually generational. If yeah, the predictions we see in IPCC, you know, they'll be for 2050 or 2080 or even 2100. Well, for somebody my age, I'm not going to see 2100. So, you know, perhaps I can just shrug my shoulders. But, and my children, who are in their 20s, they probably won't see 2100 either. But I suspect when I have a first grandchild, that will actually move my human horizon off by another generation. And I've seen this with other people who said, yes, I've got to think about my, who are a bit older than me, who's thinking, I've got to think about what the world is going to be like for my grandchildren. So, when we're limited, you know, if you're younger, you're probably not thinking that far, but your horizon is a long way ahead, but it will get pushed by another 40 to 50 years once you have kids and grandkids. So I think that's an important thing for us all to remember because 
they will exist and they will exist on this planet and what's going to happen to this planet is um, worrying. Mm. It's the tragedy of the commons, I think. You know, we have the one atmosphere. Um, that's another message I think is an interesting one to, to put across and there's, the way I do that is by taking the moon at a lower um, uh, carbon dioxide record and then showing the alert carbon dioxide record because alert which is in no the far north of Canada at 82 north that record didn't start until I think nine, the 19, mid 1970s but of course since then it's just tracked exactly the same way it's slightly different but the the patterns are all there and the, and the, the shape of the curve the actual value is slightly different just because you're further north um, but it clearly shows you know what you put out in Hawaii has an impact on alert and vice versa and what's happening in China or India is the same as what's happening in Canada and the US and we're all having the same impact um, and it's the tragedy of the commons which until we get used to the notion of we all have to do less uh, in terms of emitting uh, carbon into the atmosphere then it's in so unfortunately it can be in everybody's local interest to say nope bad idea, you know, bad for the economy. Uh, well, if my neighbor's going to do it, why shouldn't I? But if you take that to a different, uh, perhaps a, here's an analogy for that one, which is that if uh, you're, you and your neighbor are both playing music on your deck and he cranks his up louder so you make yours even louder, in the end, everybody suffers. <laughs>